Welcome to The Word Unveiled, and peace be with you. My name is Gordon Peck. I'm the Director of Evangelization Programs at St. Malachy Church in Sterling Heights, Michigan. St. Malachy, along with St. Paul of Tarsus, St. Ronald, and St. Thecla, are part of a family of parishes in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Father Joseph Gimbala is our moderator. Our program is about the life of Therese of Lisieux, the second part of our Four Holy Women of God series. So as in all things, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Prayer is for me an outburst from the heart. It is a simple glance darted upward to heaven. It is a cry of gratitude and of love in the midst of trial as in the midst of joy. In a word, it is something exalted, supernatural, which delights the soul and unites it to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So, the sources we use to put this program together includes The Story of a Soul, the book that was written by Therese of Lisieux, uh, and various other videos, uh, and, and, uh, and especially some work from Sancta Familia Media on the life of Therese and, and, uh, and the Carmel of Lisieux, and various other sources. We also looked at the uh, movie Therese, Ordinary Girl, Extraordinary Soul, which was produced and directed by Leonardo Di Filippis. It's, uh, it was produced in February of 2006. It's an hour and 36 minutes long, and you can acquire it at the EWT, EWTN Religious Catalog and other Catholic sources. So here's a photo of the Carmel of Lisieux, which looks pretty much the way it did in the time of St. Therese. A little historical background. Alençon, which is a city in Normandy in the north of France, uh, had a population of about 25,000 when Therese was born there in 1873. Alençon was and still is a regional center for lace making. And this came about because Louis XIV, the Sun King, um, was trying to elevate the status of France throughout the world, and he decided that he didn't want to rely on Venice for lace making uh, through imports, and so he cons- he encouraged lace making in France, and the community of Alençon rose to the challenge. Uh, Lisieux is nearby to Alençon, and it's the provincial capital of the Pays d'Auge, which is a region of Normandy, and it's not too far, it's just west of Paris. Now, Marie Azélie Guérin, that's her name, uh, she was generally known as Zélie, and she possessed strong devotional inclinations, and she attempted to enter the consecrated life at, in, in Alençon at Hôtel Dieu. And, but unfortunately, the prioress of that monastery did not think she had the uh, proper um, uh, vocation uh, for, for uh, religious life, and she discouraged her and prevented it. So, so Zaley was very disappointed about that, and she turned her focus to lace making because Alençon was such a center of it, and she became extraordinarily good at it and a very successful businesswoman in that in that field. She began to work with a, a woman in the beginning uh, named uh, Madame Martin, and she thought that Zaley would make an excellent wife for her son Louis, but she didn't try to introduce them. Now, Zaley and Louis would ironically meet by chance, or perhaps it was divine will, on the bridge, in the, in the center of the bridge, in the center of the town of Allenson in uh, April of 1858. And they immediately fell in love. Louis Martin was a jeweler and a watchmaker, and he had tried to enter the religious life. And he was uh, also turned down, he, he was turned down from the uh, uh, great St. Bernard uh, Monastery because he did not know any Latin. Um, so he was discouraged from entering the religious life. And so Louis and Zaley were married on July 13th, 1858 at the Basilica of Notre Dame de Alençon at a midnight wedding. So planned to escape the notice of many in the town and not call attention to themselves. Well, why would they do that? Well, <laughs> They did it because they had decided that they were going to live together as brother and sister in, a per, in perpetual continence. In other words, their, their attraction to the religious life uh, influenced how they would live out their marriage. 
Well, one or the other went to a confessor and the confessor said, no, 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 no. (laughs) That is not how you live out your vocation. And so he discouraged them from that. And they lived and they consummated their marriage and they lived a normal uh, married life after that time. They lived above Louise Watchmaking Shop in Allenson until the year 1871. And all of their children, except their youngest, who is the subject of this story, Therese, were born there. Ultimately, they had nine children. The first was Marie. She was born in 1860. Pauline was born in 1861. Leonie was born in 1863. Helene was born in 1864, but she died at age five. And then between 1867 and 1870, they lost three infants, two boys and a girl uh, who never got to be a, a year old. And then Celine was born in April of 1869. And then they moved. So when they moved into this house, which is photo, which you can see in the photo here, on the Rue Saint Paul in Alençon, and on January second, eighteen seventy-three, Marie Francois Therese Martin was born in this house. She was baptized two days after her birth at the Basilica of Notre Dame d'Alençon, the same church where they had gotten married, and. Unfortunately, Therese was a sickly infant and her parents greatly feared that she might die as three of her other siblings had in infancy. So Zaley, the mother, could not nurse any of her daughters after her third child. And so she, uh, she sent Therese to live with a woman named Rose Taillé, and she lived in a farming community of Samalie, which is a few miles northeast of Alençon. And she served as a wet nurse and caretaker for the first 13 months of Therese's life. And that house that she lived in has been now restored. And you see it in these photographs here. Uh, and the, the outside and inside, it, it looks exactly the way it would have looked when Therese grew up there in her first year of life. And it's now a pilgrimage site for many people. So Zaley, the mother, was so successful in manufacturing lace that Louis decided to sell his watchmaking shop to a nephew, and he began to handle the traveling and bookkeeping and all the business end of his life's, of his wife's uh, lace-making business. Zaley employed 15 women. They worked at home, and then they brought their, home, their work to Zaley on Thursdays. And Louis was, he was kind of a dreamer and a brooder, and he was an idolist and romantic. Um, he probably suffered from manic depression disorder. He was kind of one way or the other quite a bit. He he assigned touching and naive pet names to his children, however. He called Marie, his firstborn, his diamond. Pauline was his noble pearl. Celine was his uh, bold one. And Therese was his little queen to whom all treasures belonged. So Therese the child was continued to be sickly, Uh, through her early days, and she led a very pampered existence. That made her a bit precocious and a little bit moody, spoiled and prone to throwing temper tantrums at the very least provocation. And she, But she was educated in a very Catholic environment, so there was a certain rigidity to the schedule. Holy Mass was at 5.30 every morning, strict observance of fasts, prayer and rhythm with, with the liturgical year, charity, to those in need, and visiting the sick and elderly were all duties that the family did day in and day out. Years later, Therese admitted, I was far from being a perfect little girl. She was kind of a little brat. In December of 1876, Zaley, the mother, was diagnosed as suffering from breast cancer. And she goes to Lourdes in June seeking a miraculous cure, but none occurs, and so she's resolved to her fate. And so she implored her daughters, especially Pauline, the second oldest, to become a mother to Therese. And Zaley died on August 28th, 1877, at the age of 45. And Therese was only four. So Therese was devastated and withdrawn. And she would later later write that the first part of her life stopped on that day. Three months after Zaley died, Louis sold the house in Alençon and moved his family into a leased house in a garden setting in nearby Le Sioux. And that was because her, Zaley's brother, Isidore, lived in that city, and his family would help uh, Louis raise the girls. So Therese would write that this was the second part of her life, the most painful of the three, 
It extended from age four and a half to 14, the time when she rediscovered her childhood character and entered into the serious side of life. She made her first communion at St. Peter's Catholic uh, Cathedral, uh, the parish, her parish church in Lisieux in May 1884. She was seven years old. And afterwards, she wrote, oh, how sweet was that first kiss of Jesus. It was a kiss of love. I feel that I was loved, and I give myself to you forever. So there's seeds of a vocation there. In the early years, there was anguish and depression, however. Therese was taught at home until she was eight and a half years old. And then she was sent to a Benedictine school in Lisieux, where she received high grades, but unfortunately, she was bullied, probably because of her sensitivity and the fact that she cried so easily. So she was an easy target of the bullies. When she was nine years old, her sister Pauline, who had become her second mother, decided to enter the Carmelite convent at Lisieux. Therese was devastated once again. Her sister would be cloistered and Therese would never see her again. Or so she thought. In the early years, when Therese was nine, she began to be ill quite often. Her uncle, Isidore Guerin, took her for a walk, and he spoke to her about her mother, hoping to comfort her. But that sent Therese into an illness that lasted for weeks as she missed her mother. Just being, just talk of her reminded her. So her sister Pauline attempted to intervene from the convent and wrote letters to Therese. And that did not work, but her older sisters brought a statue of the Blessed Virgin into Therese's room, which you see pictured here. And suddenly Therese felt joy when she gazed upon it. And she wrote, our Blessed Lady has come to me. She has smiled upon me. How happy I am. In October of 1886, Marie, the oldest uh, daughter, joined Pauline in the same Discalced Carmelite Monastery, which caused further anguish for Therese. And then in Christmas Eve, 1886, an interesting event happened. Therese called it her complete conversion. They came home from midnight mass and they went to open gifts, but Therese had gone upstairs. And her father, not realizing she could hear him, said, Therese is far too old for this now. Fortunately, this will be the last year. And what he meant was treating her like a little girl uh, at Christmas time. Well, Therese began to cry and her sister Celine said, do not go downstairs to father until you've calmed yourself down. And then suddenly Therese pulled herself together, wiped her tears, and she ran down the stairs, knelt by the fireplace, unwrapped her gifts as jubilantly as ever. And then years later, she said, in an instant, Jesus, content with my goodwill, accomplished the work I had not been able to do in 10 years. And then by age 14, Therese was experiencing periods of calm and self-control. She read The Imitation of Christ, the medieval book written by Thomas a. Kempis, and other books of faith, and she began to understand some of the passages being specifically written for her. We've all had that experience, haven't we? In May 1887, she approached her father about entering Carmel before Christmas on the first anniversary of this conversion that she'd had at Christmas time. Well, Louis and Therese, they both broke down, went into the garden and cried, and Louis got up and picked up a little white flower that was growing in the garden, root intact, and he gave it to her, explaining the care with which God brought it into being and preserved it until that day. And Therese later wrote, while I listened, I believe I was hearing my own story. To Therese, the flower seemed to be a symbol of herself, destined to live in another soil. In July of 1887, she received a revelation from God that she was to see, that she was to pray for souls and, and uh, offer prayers of sacrifice to save souls around the world. And an event happened that convinced her of this, and that was that a, a seaman by the name of Henry Pranzini was in the port of La Havre, and he went into the home of a prostitute, got into an argument, and killed her. And he was arrested and he was going to be guillotined. That was the capital punishment in those days. Um, and he was unrepentant. And so Therese read this in the newspaper and she prayed and she prayed and she prayed for his soul that he would become repentant. And 
She then read the next day after he was executed that as he was going up the steps to the guillotine, he suddenly grabbed the crucifix away from the priest who was standing there, kissed it three times, asked God for forgiveness, and went to his death. So Therese took that as a sign that she wasn't just living for herself anymore. She wasn't a little girl. She wasn't a little spoiled brat. She now needed to think about others, and and she was starting to, to feel she definitely had a vocation. So she went to Princess, excuse me, Prioress, Mother Marie de Gonzague uh, of the Carmel of Lisieux, the same place her two sisters had gone, and she talked to her about entering Carmel. And uh, the Prioress said, okay, yes, you may enter. But first she had to obtain permission from the priest superior. So Canon de la Trotte, I uh, was a pastor of St. Jacques, and he thought that Therese was too young, so he referred the matter to b- the Bishop of Bayou. And the Bishop of Bayou is Thomas Paul Henri Lemonnier, and he met with Therese and her father, and Therese wore her hair up in a bun so that she would look older, and the bishop said flat out, no. And he added that he had never seen a father so anxious to be rid of his daughters as her father. So she was, he already has two girls in there. So she was disappointed, but she was not defeated. In November of 87, Therese, Celine, and her father decide to make a pilgrimage to Rome. And while Therese is there, she seeks and receives an audience with Pope Leo XIII. And so she wears her hair up in a bun to look older again. And she goes to him and she asks that she be admitted to Carmel at age 14. And Pope Leo replies, well, my child, do what the superiors decide. You will enter if it is God's will. So this trip is the first and last time Therese will ever leave her native Normandy. As she meets and talks with many priests during this trip, and she concludes, it's high time for Jesus to remove me from the poisonous breadth of the world. I feel that my heart is easily caught by tenderness, and where others fall, I would fall too. We are no stronger than the others. So she definitely wants to enter Carmel. On January 1st of 1888, the Bishop of Bayou, the same one who had denied her before, authorized the prioress to receive Therese. Could he have gotten a message from Leo XIII? We don't know. But on the 9th of April, 1888, she became a Carmelite postulant. And on July 10th, 1889, Therese received the white veil of the novice, and her new name was Therese of the Child Jesus of the Holy Face. Now, this came from the fact that her uncle, Isidore, had donated an image of the suffering face of Jesus to be hung in the cathedral in Lisieux. And Therese had such a devotion to the Holy Face that she asked for a copy of it, and she said that she wanted it to be hung from the drapes surrounding her deathbed. She's very young. Therese had no pretenses about what life would be like in Carmel. She embraced her responsibilities without complaint, and she performed small works for others in a cheerful and a quiet manner. And she started to impress some of the older sisters, some of whom thought she was just playing at being a nun because her sisters were in the same convent. But she began to develop an approach to everything that that she did with confidence in God love of others, and mercy and forgiveness for her shortcomings. And eventually, her very likable character was difficult to resist. This was the beginning of her little way. Now, her father, in 1892, suffered a series of strokes which incapacitated him, and he was admitted to a sanitarium for several months until he was released, and his daughters, Leone and Celine, the the only two still at home, cared for him. But in 1893, Leone entered the Visitation Sisters Convent in Caen. She didn't become a Carmelite, but she did become a religious sister. And Celine, the the only one still at home, with the assistance of her uncle and his family, cared for Louis until he died on July 29th, 1894. And then, in the following September, Celine decided to join her sisters in the Carmel in Lisieux. Now, life in in the Carmel, what's interesting, Therese produced many works of art that we still have. Uh, she wrote poetry, she wrote a play about St. Joan of Arc, and she produced numerous paintings and embroidery. 
And we have pictured here a chasuble uh, that she embroidered, and it shows the holy face of Christ in the center of the cross. And at the very bottom, there are two roses, which represent her parents. And there are four lilies that have not opened, and these represent her two brothers and two sisters who all died in infancy. The five blooming lilies represent Therese and her sisters in Carmel and Leone in the Visitation Convent. Therese's lily is, rep- is behind and to the left of the holy face of Jesus. So she's the littlest one. So Therese adhered strictly to the rule of avoiding all superfluous talk. She was very mature in how she handled herself within the convent. And she saw her sisters only during hours of common recreation after meals. And she even said, we must apologize to the others for our being four under one roof. She would say, when I am dead, you must be very careful not to lead a family life with one another. I did not come to Carmel to be with my sisters. On the contrary, I saw clearly that their presence would cost me dear. And then she chose a spiritual director, a Jesuit by the name of Father Pichon. And she confided to Pauline, the second oldest of the girls, that Father Pichon treated me too much like a child. Nonetheless, he did me a great deal of good by saying that I never committed a mortal sin. And some of the other sisters who didn't know her so well started to call her a big nanny goat, which is kind of surprising because she was only five foot three, but she was the tallest of all her sisters. <clears throat> and then she started to write about the, li- the little way. And this is uh, an excerpt taken from her story, the, the, her, from her book, The Story of a Soul. And she says, Jesus set before me the book of nature. I understand how all the flowers of God uh, has, that God has created are beautiful, how the splendor of the rose and the whiteness of the lily do not take away the perfume of the violet or the delicate simplicity of the daisy. I understand that if all flowers wanted to be roses, nature would lose her springtime beauty and the fields would no longer be decked out with little wildflowers. So it is in the world of souls. Jesus' garden. He has created smaller ones, and those must be content to be daisies or violets, destined to give joy to God's glances when he looks down at his feet. Perfection consists in doing his will, in being what he wills us to be. I will seek out a means of getting to heaven by a little way, very short and very straight little way that is wholly new. We live in an age of inventions. Nowadays, the rich need not trouble to climb the stairs. They have lifts instead, that is, elevators. Well, I mean to try and find a lift by which I may be raised unto God, for I am too tiny to climb the steep stairway of perfection. Thine arms then, O Jesus, are the lift, which must raise me up even unto heaven. To get there, I need not grow. On the contrary, I must remain little. I must become still less. Love proves itself by deeds. So how am I to show my love? Great deeds are forbidden me. The only way I can prove my love is by scattering flowers. And these little flowers are every little sacrifice, every glance and word, and the doing of the least actions for love. Sometimes when I read spiritual treatises in which perfection is shown with a thousand obstacles, surrounded by a crowd of illusions, my poor little mind quickly tires. I close the learned book, which is breaking my head and drying up my heart, and I take up Holy Scripture. Then all seems luminous to me. A single word uncovers for my soul infinite horizons. Perfection seems simple. I see that it is enough to recognize one's nothingness and to abandon oneself like a child into God's arms. Leaving to great souls, to great minds, the beautiful books I cannot understand, I rejoice to be little because children and those who are like them will be admitted to the heavenly banquet. So Therese then began a period of intercession for priests. At her canonical examination, she said, I came to save souls and especially to pray for priests. So she wrote to her sister, Celine, before she entered Carmel. She said, our mission as Carmelites is to form evangelical workers who will save thousands of souls whose mothers we shall be. So in 1895, a seminarian by the name of Abbe Bellier 
He asked the Carmel of Lisieux for a nun who would support, by prayer and sacrifice, his missionary work and the souls that would be entrusted to him in the future. And Mother Agnes designated Therese. She never met Father Bollier, but 10 letters passed between them. A year later, another priest, Father Adolphe Roulant, uh, he of the Society of Foreign Missions requested the same service of the of the uh, sisters at Lisieux. And once more, Therese was assigned as a spiritual sister. And he wrote, it is she who consoles and warns, encourages and praises, answers questions, offers corroboration, and instructs the priests in the meaning of her little way. Now, After observing a very rigorous Lenten fast in the year 1896, she went to bed on the eve of Good Friday and felt a joyous sensation. She wrote, oh, how sweet this memory really is. I had scarcely laid my head upon the pillow when I felt something like a bubbling stream mounting to my lips. I didn't know what it was. The next day, her handkerchief was soaked in blood. Coughing up blood meant tuberculosis, and in those days, tuberculosis was an automatic death sentence. She wrote, I thought immediately of the joyful thing that I had to learn. So I went over to the window. I was able to see that I was not mistaken. Uh, My soul was filled with a great consolation. I was interiorly persuaded that Jesus, on the anniversary of his own death, wanted to have me hear his first call. So Therese spoke about a shower of roses, and this proved to be both spiritual and actual, because as she lay dying in the convent infirmary, she could look out and see rose bushes through the windows. And as a child, she had thrown rose petals before the Blessed Sacrament. So as she reflected on her quiet, hidden, and gentle life ending, she believed in faith that God had great things in store for her. She believed that her mission was only beginning as she entered the fullness of life with God. She explained, after my death, I will let fall a shower of roses. I will spend my heaven doing good upon earth. I will raise up a mighty host of little saints. My mission is to make God loved. At the same time, a Carmelite mission in China invited her to come to them but tuberculosis was too far advanced and she could not do that. Her physical suffering kept increasing. So even the doctor that was serving her said, oh, if you only knew how much she was suffering. In July of 1897, she was moved to the infirmary where she said, I would never have believed it was possible to suffer so much. Never, never. On August 19th, she received her last communion And she died on the 30th of September at the age of 24. On her deathbed, she said, I have reached the point of not being able to suffer anymore because all suffering is sweet to me. Her last words were said while while adoring her crucifix. Oh, how I love him. My God, I love you. Therese was buried on the 4th of October, 1897 in the Carmelite plot in the municipal cemetery in Lisieux, the same place where her parents had been buried. But her body was exhumed in September of 1910, and the remains were placed in a lead coffin and transferred to another tomb. In March of 1923, however, before she was beatified, her body was returned to the Carmel of Lisieux, where it remains. And the figure of Therese in the glass coffin that you see pictured here is not her actual body, but a statue based on drawings and photos that were taken by her sister, Celine, after Therese's death. So her book, A Story of the Soul, this is her best known, uh, she's best known for this autobiography. Um, The name was La Histoire de Homme, The Story of the Soul. It was written in three parts. The first part was written in 1895 as a memoir of her childhood. And it was written under obedience to the prioress, Mother Agnes, and her older sister, Pauline. The second part is a three-page letter written in September 1896 at the request of her oldest sister, Marie, who was aware of her impending illness, and she asked her to set down her little flower doctrine. And in June 1897, Mother Agnes asked Mother Marie de Gonzague, the prioress, 
to allow Therese to write another memoir with more details of her religious life. So these three sets of writing were all compiled by Pauline, edited and put into the book that was called The Story of a Soul. Well, it took them a year to do that. And when they were done, they published 2,000 copies. And they sent these, and it was paid for by uh, good old Uncle Isidore, Therese's uncle. And these uh, books were sent to other Carmelite convents in France, Italy, Poland, and Quebec. And most of the convents asked for more copies. So to everyone's surprise, a second edition was printed six months later of 4,000 copies. And it was sold out. (laughs) And then a third, and then a fourth, and it kept going. The book was instrumental uh, in the conversion of many, um, and it was found in all parts of the world. It's a book which was pushed, which pushed the enthusiastic pilgrim to come to pray to the little saint at her grave in the Sioux Cemetery. And soon pastoral needs would suggest that a new church and a new memorial would be necessary. So now the prospect of building a church like this, which they did, this big basilica church, Uh, was not necessarily favorable with the local clergy because they didn't know where the money was going to come from. But then all of a sudden, Bishop Lemonnier, remember the one who said no to her at the beginning? He threw his support entirely behind the project and hired architects to begin the work. Foundations were laid in 1929, and on the 11th of July, 1937, during the 11th National Eucharistic Congress, Cardinal Pacelli, who had become Pope Pius XII, conducted the solemn blessing of the Basilica. This is just one year before Detroit's own most holy, most blessed sacrament cathedral was constructed. It's a basilica church, so it has an upper and a lower church. Um, It can seat 3,000 people. And the interior is painted in what in the 1930s was considered a modernist style of, of painting but it depicts besides uh, scenes of Jesus and Blessed Mother, it also has scenes of the Martin family and all of the various sisters. In the lower basilica is an adoration chapel and a crypt that contains the reliquary of Louis and Zélie Martin, Therese's parents. So all four of Therese's sisters lived out their lives in holy vocations. Marie, the oldest born in 1860, was in uh, the Carmelite mission, Monastery in Lisieux with Therese. Her religious name was Sister Marie of the Sacred Heart, and she died in January of 1940 at the age of 79. Pauline, who had been Therese's second mother, was born on September 7th, 1861, and she was also in Carmel. And her religious name was Mother Agnes of Jesus, and she died J- July 28th, 1951, at the age of 89. Leone, who was born in 1863, was a sister who went into the visitation convent. And she entered at the age of 35 after many unsuccessful attempts. Her religious name was Sister Francois Therese. And she died on June 16, 1941, at the age of 78. And Céline, Céline, the next oldest, or the second youngest, I should say, um, was born in 1869, and she was the last to enter Carmel and with Therese, and her religious name was Sister Genevieve of the Holy Face, and she was the last of the sisters to die on February 25th, 1959, at the age of 89. Now, on October 18th, 2015, Pope Francis presided at Mass at St. Peter's Basilica, which included the rite of canonization for Saints Zélie and Louis Martin. The Martins had been beatified in 2008. So the Pope stated in his homily, the holy spouses Louis Martin and Marie Zélie Guerin practice Christian service in the family, creating day by day an environment of faith and love which nurtured the vocations of their daughters, among whom was Saint Therese of the Child Jesus. They are the first ever married couple with children to be canonized in the same ceremony. And the graphic that we have shown here shows um, Maria, the oldest, at the, at the left, and then Pauline, and then uh, Louis, and then Zélie, the mother, and she has the four children 
uh, the three that were they were born in infancy and the, and the little girl who died at age five with her. Then Leone is the visitation nun is next to her. And then uh, Celine and then Therese is on the outside. So St. Teresa of the Child Jesus of the Holy Face, also called St. Therese of Lisieux and the Little Flower. Her original name was Marie Francois Therese Martin. She was born on January 2nd, 1873 in Alençon, and she died on September 30th, 1897 in Lisieux, France. She was canonized in 1925. Her feast day is October 1st. She is the patron saint of flowers, or florists, I should say, foreign missions, loss of parents, priests, and the sick, particularly those with tuberculosis. She's the author of The Story of a Soul, The Little Way, and she was elevated to be a doctor of the church in 1997 by Pope John Paul II, the third woman to be so honored. So when we look at our two Teresas, we have Teresa of Avila and we have Therese of Lisieux. And we see with Teresa of Avila that her mother dies when she's 14 years old. With Therese of Lisieux, her mother dies when she's four and a half years old. Therese of Avila, Teresa of Avila, her, her father is a strong influence in her life. And with Therese, her father is a strong influence in her life. Teresa suffers ill health all her lifetime. Therese suffers ill health all her lifetime. Teresa is a discalced Carmelite nun. Therese is a discalced Carmelite nun. Teresa leaves the, con the cloister frequently, founding foundations, founding missionary monasteries and foundations throughout Spain. Therese, however, never leaves the cloister. Teresa is known in the world around her, but Therese was unknown during her lifetime. Teresa describes love with a mystical body of the church, and Therese describes her little way of love in approaching Jesus. Teresa, her writings are read by multitudes. Therese, her writings are read by multitudes. Teresa is declared a saint in 1622, 40 years after her death, and Therese is declared a saint in 1925 only 28 years after her death. Teresa's feast day is October 15th, and Therese's feast day is October 1st. Teresa is a doctor of the church in 1970, and Therese becomes a doctor of the church in 1997. St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, pray for us. Our next program will be about Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. So now let us close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Peace be with you. Thanks for listening.